it's interesting. I want to read a passage of scripture this morning in first in Second Corinthians. You don't have it there. It's something that I, I kind of worked through this morning a little bit. So I, I apologize. It's not on the screen. Sometimes when I preach, I don't know exactly where I'm going. I have some thoughts and I have some things I've written down, but I, I just don't know sometimes where I'm going. And so one of these mornings like this, are, are, I won't have verses for you because a lot of this just developed and, and, and I didn't have time to put it on the screen and, and, and that kind of thing. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 8, Paul writes this. Uh, 2 Corinthians is a second set of letters that Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. And, 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 and I've told you this before, whenever Paul writes to different churches, he, he observes and he, he, he helps them and he wants them to be aware of things maybe that they're not experiencing and they want to experience. And, and sometimes he challenges them. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in this letter to this, to this church that was very normal and going through normal stuff just like all of us, he highlights something that I think, I think is important for us. And I just want to read that before we get into the message. It's kind of a backdrop. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says these words, We are pressed down on every side by trouble, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but never driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We are knocked down, but we are never destroyed. Never destroyed. I titled my message this morning, Under Pressure But Never Abandoned, or or, Under Pressure But Not Abandoned. Um, I started a series a couple of Sundays ago on God encounters and how um, oftentimes we look for the big things where the big miracle shows up or, or a big shift happens in our life or in someone else's life that maybe we're praying for or spending time with. And we're often looking for the big things when often God begins to do such unique little things that we tend to miss them. And we're waiting for our big moment when we would really understand the perspective. We would see there's a bunch of little moments that we've often missed. And so I'm gonna continue on the, the God Encounter series that I've started. And, and I wanna begin by saying that our, our view of God is vital to how we, how we function or how we live our life. Because if we see God as someone that's wanting to punish or to get angry with us, sometimes we can read the scripture, we can get the idea that God's angry, he, he gets ticked off when we don't do, he gets mad. And if we have that view of God that that's the way he is, we're gonna be afraid to make a mistake because he's gonna be angry with us. And when God is angry, look out, something's gonna happen. And so sometimes we've grown up with that mindset that that's how God operates. And I, I look at it different because I look at it from a perspective where these people were writing letters and making accounts, and that's where we have the Bible from. It, it's writing letters and accounts, and, and, and a lot of the personality of the author and the writers and the people that are writing these letters come out. So a lot of times how we see God is how we write right and how we feel and so I like to change the aspect of God being wrathful as God being passionate passionate over us passionate about his purpose passionate about his design for our life and when we go off course it's like he's passionate he, he his love is passionate that he's you're missing it I want to walk you just come back and walk you through It's interesting when you look at the life of Jesus, he says he's the perfect representation of the Father. Jesus exhibited one of the most greatest passions of love that anyone ever could. And so when I read the scriptures, I want to look at it from that perspective because many times our perspective of God shapes how we live and how we function, how we believe. And I want to tell you sometimes, just because we were raised in the church, sometimes our belief of God has been inaccurate. When I began to recognize for the first time that God actually loved me for who I was and was committed to walking by my side through thick and through thin to change my perspective. There's moments I go back to that because there's so much, it seems like, mental safes in your head that, that don't get cracked open very often because of things that we believed and things we were told. And so some of those areas in our mind are a no-go zone. 
And we protect those no-go zones. And, and God wants to open up those safes and begin to breathe his life into those things so that our mindset changes about who he is so that we run to him rather run away from him. Paul says, I've experienced, he said, I've been pressed down on every side by, by troubles, but I've never been crushed. Never. I've gone through thick and through thin, but I tell you, I've never been wiped out. I, I've never been abandoned. I've been knocked down, but I've never been destroyed. It's almost like one sense Paul is saying that when your perspective of God is clear, you never see you never see the destruction part of anything. You, you see there's always something at the end that gives you hope. There's always a knowing that something is going to turn in my favor. It almost gives you a sense of hope when, when everything seems to be discombobulated. Is that a word? If not, I made it up. It means confused and everything's discombobulated. I hope that's a word. Someone is probably going to write me and say, what in the world are you talking about? But that's okay. Discombobulated. It's a new word. I like it. It's just, it, you get the idea that it's just a mess. And oftentimes we ask where God is in that mess. But God is in that mess. He didn't start it. He didn't get it orchestrated. But he's in there. Why is he in that mess? Because that's where we are. Breathing hope. Breathing life. Breathing perspective. It's not who we are. We've established already in, in multiple times where I've used the phrase that, that God is always there. Um, a few series ago, we talked about you know, epic battles and how people gone through tremendous difficulties in their life and how they were never alone. God was always there. And it's a truth that I have to keep reminding myself over and over again because I forget. When I get overwhelmed, I forget. When I get bombarded, I forget. When everything gets discombobulated, I forget. I forget what's true. I forget what God's spoken over my life. I forget those things and I get overwhelmed. And, and so God is always there. I don't always recognize him because I'm overwhelmed or, 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 or things like that. But he's always there. God is always there in the, in the darkest moments of our life. He's there in the joyous moments of our life. He's always there because he loves us and committed to seeing us through. In Genesis chapter 50, talking about under pressure but not abandoned in our view of God and the whole idea of um, God encounters and recognizing God doing things in, in, in perspective. I went through, I think it was last night, uh, Genesis chapter 50. And Genesis chapter 50 is where, where um, Joseph, he revealed himself to his brothers in, in, in Egypt because of the famine. The people from the land of Canaan, Israel, had to come to Egypt because there was no food, no crops. It was a drought. And Egypt was prospering because Joseph was in charge and he got direction from God and he set it up that he would be, that would be the place to go. And his brothers went there and Joseph was the one that was betrayed by his brothers and sent to Egypt as a slave and how God worked through that whole situation. And a lot of things that, that, um, that Joseph went through, you, you could ask, where's God? But we see it because we read it. But Joseph was in the middle of it. He didn't see the end result. He was living the moments. The moments where he, his brother said, we don't like you, we hate you, we want to kill you. And then one brother said, let's just sell him. And so what happens? They, they sold him and sent him off to Egypt to be auctioned off like product. Meanwhile, they tell their story to their father that Joseph got killed by an animal and tore apart. And how his father mourned for him. And yet Joseph was very much alive. Where was God? God was orchestrating something that was far bigger for, for Israel and for Egypt and the nations of the world. Far bigger. God was raising up a person that was going to produce crop and be a savior to the world. Joseph didn't know that. He was chained, traveling to, to, to Egypt. He, he, where was God? He was chained up. And then he goes up in auction. He gets sold. He gets sold to a, to a high-ranking officer in Egypt. His name is Potiphar. He gets sold to Potiphar as a slave. Didn't know the language. Didn't know the culture. Didn't know nothing about it. it was, everything was foreign to him. Yet there he was. Where was God? God was orchestrating something. You see, he never caused that to happen. 
but he was determined to work with what he was given and began to orchestrate a plan that would shape and change the world of that day. Where was God? God was right there. He started working for Potiphar. Potiphar noticed something in, Exodus, in, 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 in the book of Genesis, and he, he began to know that God's favor was on Joseph's life, and how, how whatever Joseph touched just, just worked, and things were, his attitude, stuff was different about Joseph, and all of a sudden, he wasn't really a slave anymore. Now he promoted him to be the guy in charge of his household. In fact, the Bible tells us that he was in charge of absolutely everything other than what the king or his wife would eat. That's it. That's how much confidence he had in Joseph. Where was God? God was building something. One day came by and his circumstances turned to worse. And his, Potiphar's wife accused him of something that Joseph never, ever did. And as a result, was thrown in the prison. Where was God? Here I was getting a break. Have you ever felt that way? Finally a break. And it seems like he went two steps forward, seven steps back. Well, Joseph must have felt that way. There he was in prison. In fact, the Bible tells us he was in the dungeon. He was in the place where political prisoners were. He wasn't just a regular prisoner. He was now a political prisoner. But yet the Bible tells us that the warden recognized there was something about Joseph. It was his attitude and how he worked and how he served and, and, and how he talked and all that kind of stuff. And pretty soon Joseph was in charge of the prison. In fact, the Bible tells us that the warden didn't think nothing of it. He let Joseph be in charge. God was building something bigger than Joseph ever would dream. Two years went by in prison, two years. And all of a sudden, I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but it's awesome. Two years goes by. Two of Pharaoh's own personal assistants got themselves into hot water and threw him into the dungeon in the prison. And there Joseph put them in their cells and gave them their food and looked after them. He was the one in charge. One morning, they woke up and they were destroyed because they had a dream and they didn't understand the dream. And, and Joseph interpreted those dreams and whatever those dreams were, when it, it, that it happened, those things happened. These two political prisoners were left to go back to their jobs. One lost their life because of what he did and the other one was restored. And Joseph said to the one, he said, remember me when you go to Pharaoh. I'm innocent in here. You know, Joseph spent almost 11 years to 12 years in prison before Pharaoh had a dream. And Pharaoh dreamed a dream that disturbed him so much, yet all his, his, his seers and all his astrologers tried to combine what this dream was about. It was so dramatic for him, it just shook him. And he had it repeatedly. And finally one of the guys said, I remember there was a guy in prison. See, said, where's God? He's in the little details of stuff. He said, I know of a guy. When the two of us had dreams, he interpreted them, and exactly what he said happened. And then Pharaoh said these words that changed Joseph's life. Go get him at once and bring him to me. Joseph, out of the dungeon, gets showered, clean, washed, shaven, stands before the most powerful man in the world at that time, Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I hear that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph says, I can't. But I know that God above can. He said, tell me your dreams. And he says, and the Bible says this, tell me those dreams and I will give you the interpretation. What confidence. He could have stood before Pharaoh and been a victim. I've been hurt. I've been misused. I've been lied about. My brothers sold me into slavery. I worked for one of your key leaders I got falsely accused and I got thrown in prison and here I am 12 years later. Let me tell you, I've got a bone to pick with you. Hey, I would have. I would say, here, this is the opportunity of opportunities. Let's tell them off. But Joseph listens to the plea of the Pharaoh and says, I can't do anything, but I know God can. He never lost faith. He never lost faith. And he heard the dreams and he interpreted the dreams to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I need a guy that I can trust to take charge of this whole situation. And I don't know anyone else but you, Joseph, to do it. Oh, wow. Wow. Joseph was rejected by his family. 
sold as property. Lied about to the father to say he was torn up by an animal. Locked in chains, traveled to a country. Probably three, four days journey. Can imagine what was going through his mind during those experiences. Gets to Egypt, stands on a stage where he's auctioned off to the highest bidder. Ends up by chance going to Potiphar. No, not by chance, by design. God's seen something way more than we've seen and recognized. God's favor was on Joseph's life. And all of a sudden, people recognized God's favor and said, this guy needs to be in charge. Then a setback. A setback. Oh, I hate setbacks. I hate feeling going two steps forward and seven back. It's like if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have tried in the first place. But we think what is a setback is a reset because God's got something bigger in store. It's just a reset. It's like taking a bow and arrow and you're stretching back that bow and there's a point in that bow where it seems to be so tough. But all of a sudden you get past a certain point all of a sudden it just releases. You pull back and it's like, I don't think it can happen. I don't think it can work. Also, whoa, it comes back. Then you know you have the power behind it. It's a reset. Went to prison. God blessed him. He was in charge of the prison. And yet he still longed to be free. He told those two people, when you go back to Pharaoh, you tell them about my situation. Two years later happened and Pharaoh had a dream. Do you think that was by chance? God's in the little details of our lives, building something that's far bigger than we can see. You see, the enemy wants to point out our faults. Maybe I did something wrong. God's punished me. Maybe, maybe I didn't read enough. Maybe I didn't have faith enough. Maybe there was something that God has against me, and now this is my flight, and this is my plight. No. Just a reset. Just a reset. The bowl was tight, and then it's just released. Interpret the dream between Pharaoh, and now he was the one in charge. You know that Pharaoh took his chariots and his horses that only was reserved for Pharaoh. Pharaoh was probably the most powerful man in the world at that time. Clothed Joseph in his robes, took his signet ring. The signet ring in those days meant power and authority. And he placed it in Joseph's finger and said, you prayed around this city. And when they do, everybody's going to bow to Joseph. Signifying his authority and power that he now has over the entire nation of Egypt. And that's what they did. Joseph changed that country around because God was working in the little things. We want the miracle from being destroyed being destroyed by our brothers and sent off to auction and then a great miracle happened, freedom and everything gets blown away and I get to go back home and pick up where I left off. But God has got a bigger plan for us. God's got a bigger plan for us than immediate satisfaction of what we're going through because he is resetting us because he has something in mind for every one of us because we matter. God never left Joseph. I can give you other examples. Moses is another example. God was there with Moses. Moses sometimes felt completely alone. He's leading these children of Israel. This is fast forwarding. Now they're leading them out of Egypt. Fast forwarding. There's many times I'm sure Moses said, what in the world? These people, these people aren't listening. They're not doing anything. I'm all alone. No one cares. God was resetting. And I came loose ready for the initial blow transformation God was with Moses Moses was forgotten when he was a kid he was supposed to be killed by Pharaoh all the kids all the Hebrew babies two years and younger he was so angry he said I want all the kids killed and Moses and mom said there's a purpose and he built a little basket that floated in the river Nile you see the Egyptians worship the Nile as a god 
And that was their life spring. That was their, their food, their energy, their, their source of life was the Nile River. And so she put Moses in a basket and sent him off in the Reeves area where, where we knew Pharaoh's daughter was going to come out and, and bathe. And they would do their, their, their religious rituals and things like that. And there, there, there was a baby crying. And she said, go, go fetch that child to me. Open it up. And there was Moses, just a little baby. Where was God? Moses' sister was there and said, hey, I, I can help. I can, I, I can introduce you to the mother and she can, she can feed him until he's three years old and then you can adopt him. And Who knows? Who would ever realize that Moses would be a world changer in that history, in that moment? No one knew. But he was raised in Pharaoh's home as of Pharaoh's daughter's son who wasn't really. It was, he, he, was, he was an Egyptian. He was an Egyptian. He was an Israeli. He was raised an Egyptian. Educated. And he made a mistake. He went out to look at how all the slaves were doing. All the Israels were slaves at that time. He went out to oversee everything. And he seen two Israelis fighting each other. After he had killed one of his own men. Because he was beating them. And as he seen these two Israelis fighting one day. And said, what's going on? Can't you get along? Your family said, oh, we seen what you did. What difference does that make? And then Moses knew he had to run for his life because if Pharaoh found out he killed one of his own, then he would be an ex on the auction block. So he fled for 40 years. Where was God? Resetting. Because he was going to go back to, he was going to go back to Egypt, Moses was, and going to deliver the people from their bondage. He was in the little things. I'll give you one more example before I give a really three quick points. David. King David was in awful times. He was alone. Do you know that when his family was chosen to become king, the next king of Israel, that David had several other brothers. David was the youngest of all of them. And he was the one God chose. He never had an easy life. But yet God was there in moments. Resetting. Getting him repositioned. For him to be a world changer. Because David was. God never causes things to happen. They happen because life is just normal and general. It often happens because of decisions we make or the things we do or what even others do. But he never causes these things to happen. If we want to experience encounters with God, I just want to give you Three quick things here before we close. Three just really quick things, because I've said a lot. I had no idea what I was going to say. If we want to encounter God and experience Him, the first thing we need to do is we need to learn to recognize that God is in the little things in everyday life. we got to learn to recognize God is in the little things of life. Learn to build your bank account with what God promises over your life. Things that are in your favor. Oftentimes we're so busy. We let guilt flood us. We look at what we have and what we don't have. And we miss out what God has really given us. Often we don't recognize what God has given. We close our eyes to the things that he has already brought to us. It's interesting, in Matthew chapter 6, this is the lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. With it, we see things. It's how perspective happens, it's how we view, how we make decisions. And so he challenges us in that passage that if our, if our, our eyes are clear, in other words, not clouded by emotions, not clouded by events and past, but influenced by how God speaks of us, we're going to have a clear perspective around us. We have to learn to recognize the things that God does in everyday life. The second thing that I want to leave with you this morning is this. We have to learn to celebrate what we do see him do. We've got to learn to celebrate the things that we do see him do. Because when we begin to celebrate things, our perspective begins to change. Our view of things change. I want to learn to celebrate stuff, the little things, the little things that are not really noticeable or we think is really significant because it's those little things, build, 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 become big things. And if we learn to celebrate the little things, our eyes are not always on the big things. 
We're waiting to recognize because God is always there. He will show up. I have a challenge here. It says this. We got to learn to stop comparing ourselves with others and what they experience. God knows you and me personally, and he's ways of dealing with us personally that wouldn't work for other people. Oh, man, I wish I could have that person's life. No, we, we, we just see one perspective. Someone could say, I want Joseph's life. Look it. He's in charge of an entire nation. Look at the influence he has. And Joseph would have to tell you, that's only what you see right now. You don't see what led to this point. The resetting that has to always happen. We want the glamour, but we don't realize the process of getting to that point. I've said this many times, and I'm going to say it again. The process is just as important as the end result. Don't negate your process, church. It's just as powerful as the end result. Learn to celebrate when you see them. Recognize God showed up there. God revealed himself there. Remember, he doesn't show up because he's never left. Third and final, that is this. Learn to be a life builder in others around you. Learn to be a life builder. Recognize in others where God has revealed himself. Look, at God's here. Look, God there. Look, God here. God here. Because sometimes we need that from each other, don't we? We don't always see clearly, but man, at times there's people around us that see a lot better than we do. They have a different advantage point than us, and they can speak that into our life. I, I don't know where you're at and what you're going through, but I want to tell you, it's not for naught. Could it be that God is just resetting something in your life where you feel the pressure of that bow? And it's like, no, it won't go. No, all of a sudden, oh, there it goes. Because I tell you, when God aims at a target, when he lets the trigger go, it hits it every, every time. We may not understand how, but I'm telling you, your life is not an accident. Your circumstances are not a result of something stupid. You may think that. But God's design over your life will always bring you to where you need to be. Let's pray.